Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. Let's talk some more sector analysis. Banks had a big rip after the election have cooled off. I got Tom White with me here in the studio looking at the options and some trades. And Ken Leon joining us from CFRA, Global Director of Industry and Equity Research. Uh, Ken, the banks have fizzled the last week. Should we be worried? Oliver, you're so short-term oriented. So we went out and we're so short-term oriented. I've been told this before. Such is so, such is the domain of the multi-day show host. We went out in November. I had a, a report saying stay the course for 2025 uh, for the large U.S. banks. Uh, we're overweighted financials. Uh, the top five banks, top six, are a big part of the constituents of that sector. Um, and we think you have all the ingredients uh, for success and performance in 25 uh, for these banks. And what really matters is large cap here, uh, and that's top of mind for investors. I guess why I've got a little bit of a short-term view on it is that the ramp was so, it seems, speculative on policy just overnight on the election that that makes it seem to me that there's risk of short-term weakness. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, so that, that's, you know, the three legs. Most important is, you know, rates are still likely to be uh, easing or lower. Okay. Uh, it does, you know, the, the analysts, the bank analysts, which are a nervous lot, were worried because net interest income perhaps could be year over year down, but down materially. Uh, but what offsets that is loan volumes. Loan volume growth should be positive, um, and that, drives net interest income as well. Uh, of course, uh, we're coming off the trough of the investment banking cycle. Uh, in 2024, uh, fixed income underwriting has done really well, but equity underwriting IPOs, M&A, that's for next year. And uh, with the Trump election, uh, as noted by just about everyone now, policy and regulation is gonna be more pro-business. Uh, the other key point here, on, on the capital markets, the financial sponsors, the private equity firms, typically are uh, mid-teens as a percentage of the total volume to 20%, and they have been much lower, and they got over $1 trillion of owned uh, companies that have to have an exit in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, I think the picture here, uh, again, is very positive, and, and one, of course, where if the market's looking for a cyclical kick with the economy, uh, but also getting yield and lower valuations, uh, even to the S&P 500, uh, we're overweight uh, the large global U.S. banks. Uh, you see positive implications for Bank of America, City, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, just looking at your note for uh, the coming year. Uh, the thing about the IPOs, real quick, for those that do uh, hinge more on capital market activity, we go to the uh, NASDAQ every day in the afternoon to check in on where they're at and their IPO pulse is signaling there should be way more activity than basically there is. There's a pretty full pipeline. What's gonna dislodge that and get that juice flowing? Well, I think it's gonna happen uh, in next year. We're already seeing that in Hong Kong today, uh, more so from the China market. Um, but um, again, I cover the alternative asset managers, the Blackstones, KKRs, mm -hmm. uh, all these firms, uh, they cannot uh, raise new flagship funds unless they can go to their same investors and monetize or exit on the existing funds. You know, and these are five, seven year cycles uh, and we're way overdue there. So that's a catalyst. It was not there the last two years. And then the corporates and we'll see what CEO confidence is um, are going to be looking at uh, organic growth, of course, but also targets that can help them um, in in their existing markets with M&A. Uh, okay. I don't have a problem with capital markets. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, Ken, do you want to see companies then, if we're going to be in a deregulatory and lower uh, friction environment, should these banks then be uh, investing capital in some way or should they be giving it back? What do you want to see in terms of like dividends buyback? Should they be jacking them up or what's the theory there if they're going to have a favorable environment? So we're, we're definitely moving, when you look across not only the Fed, but the FDIC, uh, regulators of the banks is uh, probably a, a little bit more uh, constructive versus restrictive. Uh, in the weeds of regulation, uh, the likelihood is that uh, something called Basel III endgame, which 
the worries were of a capital reserve build uh, in the next two years was likely to be less, maybe eight or nine percent, not 15 to 20 percent. That was part of the bear story. Uh, lastly, um, when we look at what these banks can generate, particularly if uh, we don't see a red alert on credit risk or loan losses, which I don't think we will in 25, um, there's going to be adequate capital for the business, but also for return. So that's dividends. So for investors, again, looking for growth and in income or equity and in income funds, the banks are going to be an important part of that story. Okay. Good stuff, Ken. Thanks for the top down look. We'll dive into some of the names and some detail next time. Appreciate that. Thank Good discussion, you. Ken Leon uh, from CFRA, Tom White from Schwab Network. Uh, all right, Tom, you got a trade in City, yep. and um, you got one in JP Morgan? Yep. Okay, well, let's do City first. Uh, let's knock that one out because um, that one's always a little bit more volatile, a little bit more fun. Yeah, and it's been. Uh Doing pretty well so far this year. It's up 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, the CEO change has been uh, pretty good. The job cuts uh, kind of helped them. The CFO was out talking this morning. Yep. Uh, not seeing any uh, delinquency, car delinquencies, anything unusual there. Better than expected. NII, X Markets uh, moving forward. Uh, they uh, reaffirmed their guidance that they gave last, uh, last quarter uh, on their earnings. Um, and uh, they're at the U.S. Financial Services Conference. So CFO's saying some positive things. I think that's why you've seen the reaction in the stock. So I looked at this one of two ways because uh, of the fact that what Ken just mentioned, dividends, right? This pays a 3.1% dividend yield in Citigroup. It's already had a 40% run so far this year, hitting over three-year highs. Um, so uh, I think he's got a $73 price target. So I looked at a strategy that takes advantage of collecting that dividend yield while still owning the shares for upside exposure. Uh, so for every 100 shares of stock you buy, I look, went out to the January 17th monthly cycle uh, and sold the 75 strike call against every 100 shares of stock that you buy. You're paying roughly a debit of about 71 bucks. So you're buying the shares at a discount, about a 2% discount to where it's currently trading. And then by owning the shares, you're allowed to collect that dividend. So you're creating yields, uh, yield in two different spots on this trade. Uh, with the dividend uh, that you get to collect and then also selling an out of the money call to the upside uh, on this one. So buying the shares at a discount, getting to collect that 3.1% dividend yield. They've got earnings on the 15th of January, so keep that in mind also. Okay. All right. Uh, decent approach, it seems like. Mm -hmm. uh, for a stock that's been pretty reliable and grinding higher. Yeah. Uh, what about for J.P. Morgan, uh, which uh, had a great, great run, kind of fizzled a little bit, basically trading uh, right where it was the night after the election? Yep, um, uh, the all-time high of just above 254 that it hit just last month. I believe uh, CFRA has a $275 price target on this one. So a little bit more aggressive, but avoiding. So they report earnings on the 15th of January also. I want to avoid that day, but take advantage of any potential continued run-up into that uh, earnings event here, as the banks have done pretty well. This stock's up about 43% this year. So we went out to the January 10th weekly cycle. 31 days to expiration on this example. Uh, and I'm buying an, a slightly in the money 240 strike call. And then against it, uh, I want to be right about at that all time high, uh, just above 254. Sell the 255 strike call against it. So you're buying uh, the deep in the money that's got the higher delta, selling the 255 call uh, against it to offset some of the costs on this trade. $15 wide bullish call vertical, paying roughly about a $6.20 debit for it. Takes your break even to 246.20 over the next month. That's only about a percent above the current share price in there. So you don't need a monster move to the upside. You're paying less than half the width of this. If you think uh, JP Morgan going into that earnings event is going to uh, reach all time highs, this strategy takes advantage of it. And because you're buying it with lower implied volatility levels as the stock has rallied this year, implied volatility levels have fallen. That gives you a cheaper price entry point on uh, directional plays like this. And it gives you some flexibility as far as closing it early, too. All right. Uh, which you are going to uh, avoid earnings, though, so you're closing it early, even earlier. Yep, it expires the, the week before earnings. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, fast time moves. Yeah. Talking earnings again. Mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan, only a couple, of, uh, about a month away. All right. Thanks, Tom, for the trades. Some upside in the banks. Thanks to Ken Leon for the bullish take.